Exciting. I'm here with um, Dr. Paul Wood. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Good, bro. For a second there, I thought you'd forgotten who you were with. <laughs> okay, this is going to be an awkward start. <laughs> yeah, it's always hard when you forget your date's name. Yeah. It's... Oh, God. Well, at least um, you're by the wrong name, even worse. <laughs> I'm trying to think if I've ever done that. Have you done that? Um... I, I suppose like the challenge I get regularly is that I work with so many people because I spend so much yeah. of my time speaking at conferences, facilitating workshops, and you'll relate to this, bro, is that I'll see people and they look way too familiar and I know I know them. And there'll be some that I know I know well, like they might've been a participant on a whole series of workshops I've done. And I just can't for the life of me remember their name. And that's a struggle. But the problem is I live in Wellington as well. So Sometimes I think people look familiar. I try to be polite and go up and say, oh, hey, you look really familiar. And I don't actually know them, bro. I'm, I'm, I fully relate to that. And I think part of that's because social media as well. Like uh, I might see someone come across my feed or they might recognize me from social media and they look at you knowingly and I'm like, how do I know this person? And they're like, oh, we've never met. I just follow you on Instagram or whatever. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I worry if it's head trauma because I've been punching the head a lot, but I Whoa. Like think- Whoa, <laughs> <Right? Snap. laughs> I, I've had multiple concussions before we knew concussions were an issue, right? So yeah. I don't know if that means it doesn't apply to me. <laughs> Is yeah. it only now that we know you have to worry? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, you know, I fully relate. Hey, so for anyone who's tuning in and who's not familiar with you and what you do, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell you, oh, tell the people who, who you are and what you do. Okay, so my name's Paul. Uh, I'm probably best known because of my personal transformation from imprisoned, drug addicted, convicted murderer to someone who actually changed their life and is trying to make a positive contribution to society these days. That's probably what most people know me for. Uh, um, yeah, like I say, you know, my, my background's in psychology and I spend most of my time these days helping people figure out basically how they can more effectively navigate the inevitable struggle that is life and how they can do so in a way that enables them to pursue their potential, to be happier with their lives, whatever their circumstances look like, and to really, yeah, have a bit of time, I suppose, in terms mm-hmm. of... Yeah, everything. You've written two books to that end? <clears throat> First best-selling book, How to Escape from Prison. <laughs> yeah, can I tell you? Can I tell you, bro? That's awesome. <laughs> I know, this is like an info. You've just gone like, this is now like an infomercial. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> but when, when I had this book first published, what myself and Harper Collins, who are the publisher, did is that we donated copies of all of this to the prison libraries, right? And, you know, you can imagine some initial hesitation eh, in terms of accepting this book into the library. But you can imagine even more so, there's definitely been some people in the prison system who have been in the prison library, having a look at the box, seen the title of this one, and then been sorely disappointed when it wasn't really a how-to manual. But um, apparently very popular in prison, which is cool. And that's about my story, my junior change. And one of the things I always like to say there, which I think is so important, Richie, is that, you know, we like to have this narrative that you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, you do it yourself. But the reality is, man, is we're part of a system, eh? We're part of an ecology. And I would not have been able to change my life in the way I have if it wasn't for massive amounts of support and opportunity from other people. You know, the reality is, is you have to do the work yourself. But unless you've got that support and those opportunities, man, you're never going to get as far, eh? And um, here's my latest book. (laughs) (laughs) Both of these, by the way, are available in Audible, Kindle, and every good or bad bookshop. You nailed that. uh, Yeah, bro. This is a real cool one. I like this one because this one's really my professional expertise. And it's it's, it's interesting, eh? Because when you write like an autobiographical book like that first one, which is about my story, you don't feel a sense of pride around it because it's, it's just your story. And we've all got a story, eh? And because we're so close to it, you just kind of go, oh, well, you know, that's just my story. And, and in many respects, too, I don't feel a sense of pride around it because, man, I did some massive harm earlier in my life. So mm. in many respects, all I did was the reasonable thing, which was to stop doing that kind of harm and to start making a positive contribution. Uh, you know, whereas this book, this more latest one, this is based on what I've invested all of my professional time and capability in, which is really around that 
you know, how can I be more effective in life, dealing with adversity, but flourish as I do so, man, not just co-pay, but flourish through mm. the challenge and pursue my potential. And uh, I love that book because I, I think the mm. way I've conceptualized things really makes it more accessible for people who are more naturally going to turn off when it comes to talk around resilience and stuff like that. And that's people who, like myself, are more naturally knuckle-dragging in inclination. And I say that with the greatest affection, right? But, you know, I'm like that. So a book's written for people like me. And, uh, you know, I think that's the best way to go about writing books, eh? Is, is write them in a way that you'd want to read yourself, that you're interested in, all right? I really like that, because what you're saying is that you're not trying to appeal to everyone. I know it's hard to believe that I wouldn't appeal to everyone. <laughs> well, I, I mean, but I certainly know, bro. I'm not. I'm not well, everyone's cup of tea, and that's all good. You just you know sent me a really um, thoughtful email in regards to that about, look, you're not going to... Because I, at, you know, I guess there's part of me that is a real people pleaser, and, it's, mm. and, and I'm getting better at not being liked by people. <laughs> But I think I spent a lot of time wasted trying to appeal to everyone. But dude, I'm I'm not everyone's cup of tea. I'm polarizing. Uh, how do you how do you deal with that? But can I just say, bro, you're not everyone's cup of tea. But for the people who you are, the people for, bro, you're catnip. Uh, <laughs> can't get enough of you, man. <laughs> Thank and, you, bro. Yeah. And you know, look, it's such a natural thing, right? Like if I look at my early life, like my teenage years. So many of the bad decisions I made were really about acceptance of my peer group, feeling that mm. I was seen and valued, that I was liked and that I belonged. Mm. And that's such a natural desire for members of a social species. You know, we evolved to be members of relatively small nomadic tribes. And it was so important within that context that you weren't such a dick that you were kicked out of the tribe. Because if you were such a dick that you got kicked out of the tribe, guess what would happen relatively quickly, mm. Richie? you would die 100 percent, because we haven't evolved to be apex predators right we've evolved to be members of a collective community who can support each other who can work together who can collaborate for our survival and so basically we've got this you know stone age brain in a modern world where we've still got these emotional responses to things that helped keep our ancestors alive like 150,000 years ago so we have this desire to be accepted to belong to be seen to be valued and on that basis, we don't like being disliked. We don't like people, you know, um, taking shots at us interpersonally, those sorts of things. But the irony is, of course, is that, you know, we now inhabit this period of time where how many people can give you their opinion of you? What is it, like 8 billion or something <laughs> yeah. in the world? And probably 7 billion on the internet, right? Yeah. And so I, I think it's really important that we do have mechanisms in place that are now uh, allow us to really narrow down and reduce the impact of those opinions because bro i'm like you right i like to be liked 100 percent. and i talk about my story so much because it's a redemptive vehicle for me to have a positive impact on others but it's also one where i know there are going to be people who are not going to get past my behavior at 18 you know i unnecessarily took another person's life when i was a teenager you know i had this situation where you know, I, I caught up with uh, my then drug dealer. I didn't really know him well because he used sort of like cutouts. He used other people to really be doing the sort of like on the ground dealing. But I caught up with him on this occasion, you know, him directly. And this was like three days after my mother had died. And my mother was like the one source of softness and support in my life or potential softness and support because I re never really took advantage of it because I grew up thinking that as a man, I should never need anyone else's support. But she was a soft influence and she had just died, this, this one sort of like really kind person in my life and uh, chose to catch up with this guy three days later. Nothing unusual in that. What I didn't realize when I chose to catch up with him was that he had an aggressive interest in adolescent boys and sex acts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was someone whose comfort zone was violence. So I grew up my whole life thinking violence was the measure of the man. When I was at school, bro, I wasn't interested in trying to be smart or anything. I felt no connection with education. And, and in fact, in the period I was growing up in, particularly in the 80s, to have been intellectually capable as a male at school would have been perceived as effeminate. And that was not a good thing. We should be sobered by that, eh, bro? That like, 
you know, mm-hmm. to stand out as smart would have been seen as as something that was emasculating at that period. I don't know how true that is now, but it sure was then. No, it still persists, man. It's crazy, right? Yeah. But anyway, so I grew up in this period and I, I didn't want to be smart. I wanted to be the toughest in my year. That's what I was always testing and striving towards at school. And, you know, as we've discussed, you know, when we caught up, you know, I'm a lifelong martial artist as well. So I was into martial arts probably from about six or seven, you know, first did uh, judo and then very quickly ended up doing judo and what was called Kempo School of Martial Arts at the same time, which was like mixed martial arts before that existed as a piece of terminology. And unfortunately, I didn't have the maturity level or the role models to really get the ethos, the Bushido of sort of martial arts at that time. And so I just used them as a vehicle to be more effective at violence in many respects. Um, But I grew up in that context and I was someone who had experienced some really minor sexual abuse myself. And I say bloody minor because it's so important to do so. Uh, Well, is it? Because I wouldn't want you to minimize it. No, bro, it is. It is. And this is the reason I think it's really important to clarify is that I didn't experience like ongoing problems at home or anything like that that so many people do where you don't inhabit a safe environment Mm -hmm. uh, where there's fundamental betrayal of trust and close relationships or anything like that. You know, I I experienced something minor with a stranger when I was sort of just getting into my teens, would have been about 12, maybe just 13. And and, and it was minor. And and to be honest with you, like I mention it because it gives context, Mm. but like I don't identify as a victim or anything. Like it's not part of my personal narrative that's a key component. Whereas there are some people who have such horrendous experiences and have such high levels of trust portrayed when they're young and feel such a strong sense of impact from it that it really does, you know, affect them way more than I am these days. And part of the reason I'm less impacted by it is because as an adult, I've done the work to get past the beliefs that it's it's your fault in some way. So as a teenager, I thought it was, an, you know, another indication there was something wrong with me, that it was my fault in some way. I should have stopped this. I must have attracted this. Therefore, I was some kind of like deviant. And also as well, bro, the period I grew up in, particularly in the 80s, but also in the 90s, man, New Zealand was so much more homophobic than it is now. I think young people growing up now don't really get how strong that homophobia was. You know, when I was preparing for this today, like I brushed my hair. Ooh, there you go, bro. I'm letting you know all the secrets now. And I was like, Reggie's a dude who brushes his hair too. I, I, I do more than brush it, bro. There's a lot of hot dogs. I'm getting my, my hair cut every two weeks on the dog. Oh, legend, legend. But the reason this came to mind for me is because I was thinking about this homophobia of when I was a kid. And let me give you an example. I remember being in the changing rooms at a swimming pool once when I was a kid and hearing a guy abuse another guy because the guy was brushing his hair. Yeah, yeah. They didn't know each other, but he saw him brush his hair and he went, Oh, you fag, stop brushing your hair. And, and, you know, this is the kind of stuff that you're exposed to is just part of standard New Zealand culture at that period. And I tell you this right now, you know, this meant that that kind of experience was had an even darker cloud because the homophobia around that, and there's me having like had a same sex experience and going, oh my God, you know, there's something wrong with me and all of this. And then, you know, having this situation where someone aggressively attempted to, uh, I suppose, I would say engage in that type of activity again with me, uh, which which led to their death and me in prison. You know, what, what collection of factors. And I'll tell you this right now, you know, I've got two boys. I've got a six-year-old and a four-year-old. And if either of them grows up to be a member of the rainbow community, if either of them grows up to be gay or anything, I hope these days that in their playground, if another kid says to them, oh, you're gay, they're like, and I'm tall, you know, that it's just a yeah, yeah. non-issue, bro. But when I was a kid, that was the surest way to get physical intervention from an adult. It was the biggest insult you could call another boy. So I'm just giving this as context, eh? And so I carried all of this into the situation. And I, you know, I had no idea where the situation was going. And they didn't either. And we made our choices that day. And those choices led them to be dead and led me to be in prison. And I'll tell you this right now. I 100% earned my place in the New Zealand prison system. Uh, I, I chose to go significantly beyond what was required of me in terms of self-defense in that situation. There was a point where I had defended myself and I could have allowed them to leave my house. And instead, I chose to take actions that unnecessarily ended their life. And I think it's really important to be clear about that because the problem is, is that my victim was a criminal, right? 
And so it's really easy to minimize my actions and to villainize them. But I'll tell you this right now, had I been the person who had died that day, people would have picked up the paper the next day and did with me the same as they did with them, which is to go, oh, well, good riddance to bad rubbish. Who cares? One criminal kills another criminal, no loss. But of course, I've had the opportunity, bro, to reevaluate my life, to realize this wasn't my path. You know, this was based on, you know, what I interpreted of other people's expectations of me, society's expectations of me. And on this basis, I've had the opportunity to choose to change my life and therefore to, you know, uh, try and make a positive impact. So hopefully at the end of my life, I can look back and go, despite my early actions, it was worth me living. I did more harm than good. Whereas, of course, they'll never have that chance. Mm. The reason I was of course, is because of that horrendous behavior when I was young. Whenever I talk about my story, there's people who understandably in the audience don't get past my behavior at 18, right? But, you know, I've, I've developed the tools and the skills to get way better at being less impacted by those people and by the concerns I have around them being there. Because, you know, for me living my mm -hmm. values and trying to have the positive impact I want to have, that requires me to make space for that discomfort. It requires me to get past that oh so natural but really unhelpful worry about everyone needing to like me and agree with me. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes good sense. It makes really, really good sense. I really appreciate you sharing that because I guess as a professional with a vaguely public life, I, I kind of a bit hamstrung by my desire for yeah to but how you've explained it is, is really really personally helpful and i'm sure everyone listening to this or watching this will find it helpful too yeah and, and can i just say richie like the document i sent through you is one i developed for people and and you know in the workshops who who go to these with me to help them get better at focusing on the opinions that matter and cutting out the noise and the rest of it and if anyone's interested in it, look, if they just hit you up or otherwise, just send them a copy. It's all good. You want to talk people through the document? So they yeah, I mean, basically the idea is, you know, there's been a bit of work done around different places around how to, how to focus on the opinions that matter. And just to go back to that tribal example, this is what, this is what the, the theorization suggests, is that we probably didn't live in hunter-gatherer tribes that were any bigger than 140 people. And the reason for that is, is you can't have really meaningful relationships with more people than that number as part of a community. How many, how many did you say? 140. Yeah. And so that sort of limited how big <laughs> our communities were, uh, because again, beyond that, you would have to start to get these different structures. And with the agricultural revolution, that sort of stuff started to shift and change. But when you talk about nomadic tribes, people who are heavily uh, interdependent on each other for their survival, that was about the cap, they reckon. And so on that basis, you know, we, we have this desire to worry about other people's opinions. And what the document does is it, is it enables you to just really be more conscious and deliberate about who's you focus on. And so what I've done is I've taken the standard stuff around this, which is to go, okay, you know, whose opinions really matter to me? If I had to write down the opinions of the people who actually really love me and care about me and accept me for all my failings and fallibilities, even though they might not always like them, but who genuinely want the best for me. And I'm talking about these kind of people, Richie. The kind of people who would give you advice that they believe is in your best interests, even though it might not be in theirs. Check that out for a good qualifier, eh? Mm. Now, again, it's not that you're always going to agree with the opinions of these people, but these are the people whose opinions you want to let into your heart. You really do want to critically evaluate them and think about them. They're people who you don't want to be upsetting unnecessarily. So, you know, you really want to take their opinions on board. You really want to think about them, but that's going to be a very small number of people, bro. Basically, if you start writing this list and you've got more than about four or six people, you've been too generous. And, you know, there's different people who might fall into different areas there as well. There might be some people who you go, look, their opinions really matter to me in this space, but not this one. So it's always more complex than any model makes out. But, you know, these are the core people who are on your list. And what I'd recommend is anyone who actually does this exercise and goes, okay, who are the people who really care about me? You know, who really care about me and whose opinions want to matter? I'm going to write them down. I would highly suggest you then tell those people that they made it on your list. And the intention of doing this, of course, is that, well, what do you reckon that would do for them, Richie? Well, how would you feel to be told you've made it on someone's list like that? I'd feel really touched. 
I'd take I'd I'd also take it as a, a responsibility. Uh I would take it as how would I take that? I, I guess I would does that mean that you want me to tell you when I think you're doing good or bad? You know, like is this an invitation to be more in your life or do you know what I mean? Like uh, I think often when we never really, you know, so people get in touch with me all the time, as I imagine they do you, hey, yada, 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 has got a drug problem or they're cheating on their partner or whatever. And I'm like, do I get involved in that? Do they want me to get involved in that? Is me getting involved in that personal experience going to be helpful? And should I know that I am on someone's list of people's opinions that I trust and want to hear from, maybe that's an invitation to, to be a more proactive friend. Mm, yeah, maybe so, eh? But it's useful, right? It's useful stuff to be thinking about. Useful, You're not going to yeah. know that unless you know that. And yeah. again, that first bit of just, hey, you're so seen and valued by me that you make the cut here. Yeah, um, yeah. Right, so there's a... Uh, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so there's all of those elements, all right? right? But then what I suggest, what the document has as well, is then there's this second list where you go, okay, well, those that that's my, like, the core people, the opinions who matter. But then what are the in- opinions that empower me? And what I mean by this is that the opinions that enable me to make a more informed choice about how I behave, about how I show up. Now, these aren't people who necessarily have the same care and concern and love for me, but they are people who have an impact on me in some way. They might be co-workers, they might be in-laws, they might be siblings, you know, who knows who's on this list, but they have to be people who actually know you and who you have to have some kind of interaction with in order to be effective. And so for me, clients would be on this list, right? Yeah. Like I am always interested in hearing from people about how they perceive my uh, performance as a facilitator and as a speaker. And that's because I am driven by continuous improvement and they're paying me money. And on that basis, I want to be professional. I want to deliver for them. And also I want to use the opportunity in order to be able to try and enhance my capability, my expertise. But I don't let them into my heart in the same way as I would say my wife's opinion, who's on that, mm. you know, the opinions that matter. But I'm interested. I'm curious about them. I want to know them. But again, it's only to help me make informed decisions. I certainly don't need to buy into them. I how certainly do you, need, don't need to change what I do. How do you put like a, how do you differentiate between what you let into your heart and what you don't do? Ah, now this is the thing, right? <laughs> You know, yeah, well, well, this is the challenge. And I'll tell you this right now, when people who aren't on the opinions that matter list give me a viewer an opinion that is, you know, indicative of not liking me or disagreeing with, or here we go, here we go, Richie, unfairly judging me on something which isn't true. There's a good one for you, eh? Mm-hmm. Provoke an emotional <laughs> Oh my God, you have no idea. Oh, bro, I, I, can, I can just imagine your life, right? <laughs> then what I do is I feel the sting of that I feel the righteous indignation and then I go you're not on my list right yeah right so it's about having that way to sort of like minimize and reduce the rumination how much it impacts you rather than to not be impacted by it at all does that make sense yeah it does so you have developed a cognitive filter for your emotional somatic experience Oh my God, you use so many big words then. I, I would have I'm just trying to show off. Hand hand deep 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 <laughs> but is that correct? Like, yes. you, yeah, yeah. Okay. 100%. And I think this is a really important idea to know is that there is <laughs> no method or mechanism that enables you to just completely remove those unpleasant emotions from your experience. Yeah, man. Because I go yeah. to, I go to, and I, I don't tell me if you're the same, I go to like, like proper sorrow or rage those are kind of my two like default settings right like I either want to smash someone or something or I want to like listen to heaps of sad music and cry a lot and not really Mm. yeah yeah look I I definitely relate you know my wife will be the first to say that I am a very dramatic person I'm a very (laughs) dramatic person (laughs) I would reframe that as passionate Richie but this is the (laughs) idea right and but this is the challenge as well is that you know, you can't base your own well-being on other people's opinions of you because people's opinions are based on their perceptions of you. 
and people's perceptions don't necessarily cap capture what your intentions are or, or what might the reality be, but people's yeah. perceptions are their reality. And, you know, different people will see exactly the same thing in a different way. So, look, I, I just want to acknowledge, I have the same type of experience, right? I'm, I'm, I'm temperamental is how I like to refer to it, right? Mm. As, as I'm quick in terms of that emotional change. So, again, a tool like this is to just sort of help me, you know, just dial back that reaction a lot quicker before it becomes problematic before I might do something or say it, something that's problematic yeah, that, or dwell on it, right? Yeah. I think that's the thing is it, it is good to not demonize those emotions. It's the actions that come out of them. And in my defense, like while I might feel this way, I don't go out and smash people over. And I'm <laughs> really good at smashing people over because I spent my, yeah. like you, my lifetime practicing combat. So I think that's uh, something we need to acknowledge is like, we all feel an emotional experience and for men in particular often that's anger but how do we help men dial back that i'll, so I'll, I'll tell you something anger. interesting about that actually is the research suggests that women experience anger as much as men do really they just okay. tend to demonstrate it differently sure women are more likely to internalize and men are more likely to externalize mm -hmm. and one of the reasons associated with that and i'm sure you know many of your listeners won't be surprised by this but men have a smaller part of the brain <laughs> called the septum, which is responsible for controlling strong emotional responses and emotional anger. And it's just not as effective as, as, as the uh, neurology of women. So, you know, there's heaps of other differences. That, by the way, every time you say anything about the brain and brain functioning is an oversimplification relative to the complexity of how it works. But yeah, so that's an interesting one, eh? It's not that men feel it more it's just that they're more likely to externalize it um and one of the things i was going to say as well is that you know even when you get opinions from those people who uh, aren't in your circle of opinions that matter you still want to evaluate them you still want to go is there any truth to this is there any benefit in this for me but the filter you use there is more around your values rather than whether people like you or not for example when i get critical feedback or people make comments I go well is this because I'm in some way demonstrate a behavior that's not actually consistent with my values and if it is I'm going to take that as a really important nudge to get back on that path but if it's not my values are the ultimate measure against which I will judge myself and so that has to be that key the the, the key criteria there and then there's this whole other circle, which is just the noise circle, which is opinions that just distract. And these are people who don't know you. These are people who don't care about you, have no interest in you, but are more than happy to share their opinion with you. And so that's one where, you know, like, that's like my the whole thing now, that's like some of his fucking life is like sharing yep. opinions about other people. Yeah, and, and you know, I was thinking about this after our conversation the other day, is that like you inhabit such a different space because so much of your contribution is based on what you share online, mm -hmm. you know, and, and because you're, man, you're like, you know, you're, you're a social force. Whereas to be honest, most of my work is in the corporate environment. Most of the workshops I do, that sort of stuff is geared towards organizations and particularly leaders within organizations because that's my professional background. And uh, that means that my online presence, you know, I don't engage in quite the same way as you do because it's not the vehicle for me to make an impact in the, in the same space that you do. Yeah. And so, for example, for those opinions that are just noise, those opinions that just distract, I can easily unplug from those. I don't have to go in and be looking at stuff as much as you do. Whereas, you know, you're more exposed to that stuff just by virtue of the way you make an impact, I think. Does that sound right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I'm not, I'm far from alone in that experience. Like, that's a lot of people. Like, uh, you're familiar with Matteo and Sarah Brown. They just wrote the book. She's of course, like, of course. The they've legion. Got, yeah, they, they've got hundreds of thousands of followers. And oh, wow. um, yeah, huge, hundreds of thousands of followers from all around the world. And I'm really saddened to hear some of the horrible, horrible things that, that they get. And I, I know lots of people personally who deal with the same sort of stuff, whether they're UFC fighters, like I was talking to Dan Hooker recently and some of the shit that he deals with, but he doesn't care because he's got, without articulating it, exactly the same sort of 
model that you've explained mm. Mm. it's like who is this person you know like and why would i let them distract me from m- my life my family my true purpose same with sierra and matt I, yeah. and it is about that filtration system that you're t- that you're talking about yeah and how you conceptualize that stuff too right because it's kind of like if you're not getting some of that are you really making a difference? Yeah, yeah, that's it, right? Like, um, whenever you throw rocks, you're going to make waves. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So I think that's quite a good thing to keep in mind, too. You know, it's interesting, too. Like, I definitely have, um, you know, r- received mm. some some strong messages from people about <laughs> burning <laughs> in hell, yeah, about right. burning in hell and other such things. Um, you know, as you would expect, right? But again, I think a really important part there is to be able to to go for this person to invest this much time and emotional energy in communicating with me, someone who certainly shouldn't be an important person in their life, right? Yeah, you're completely that's, that's a bit of a their own struggle going on in some way. Yeah. And, and a particularly interesting one when it comes to the anger one is that, you know, anger is just the public manifestation of an inner pain someone's not coping effectively with. You know, there's always something that sits underneath it, eh? Yeah. It's um, it's really interesting. Like, I think, you know, one, one of the things I find most useful is having some tools that help me actually sort of drill down into, you know, what are the emotions and why, I'm, why am I having them? You mm-hmm. know, what's leading to them in order to be able to move mm-hmm. on from them a bit quicker? And, uh, you know, and, and like one of the sort of models I talk about there is the hee-haw model. What animal am I trying to be, do you reckon, Richie? A dog. Hee-haw. Eeyore, they're like they're from yeah, when it's post- this, Thompson, this, right? this, exactly donkey. This is <laughs> how you avoid being Eeyore, you yeah. know, the, the post traumatic donkey. Eh? <laughs> he is, it's only like as an adult, I'm like Eeyore has depression, yeah, bro. Right. He, he has post traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> no, seriously, have you that you know, they they did that uh, that show about the author of oh, I didn't know it, yeah, and he came back from uh, World War One, I, I think it was. Sure. Or, with, with PTSD from his experience there. And, you know, the characters were a way for him to work through his own trauma and he represented his PTSD. Really? Is that? Yeah. Now, awesome. you know, it might've been World War II, not World War One. I. I just want to let people know that, you know, yeah. I didn't, didn't check back on this before this conversation, but yeah, it's an interesting one, eh? But anyway, the, it's the whole part of that, the H-A-W, that is like a, an acronym to help you drill into the stuff, which is how am I feeling about what and why? And if you can ask yourself those three questions, when you're starting to experience the, you know, the challenge, what it does is it re-engages the thinking part of your brain. And so it reduces the bandwidth available to the reactive part of your brain, to the really emotional part of your brain, your amygdala. And in doing so, it just helps you create a little bit of space between the stimulus and your reaction to it. And it helps shift it from the stimulus, which is the thing that's causing you to feel the emotion, to actually give you enough space to make a response rather than just react. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's really powerful. Bro, I do this all the time. I'm married, which means I spend a lot of time feeling unpleasant emotions. <laughs> Not because my wife isn't fantastic. She is. She's fantastic. But because relationships are hard. Yes. And particularly if you're tired, you're hungry, you're stressed, you've had struggles with the kids, you've been busy at work, it's even harder. And so I'll feel like, oh, gosh, you know, I'm getting asked to do this or I'm not being appreciated for this or she's taking this in the wrong way. And I tell you what, when I go, well, how am I feeling about what and why? I'll realize a lot of the time, well, you know, I'm feeling this way about this interaction and that's because I haven't eaten or I'm tired <laughs> or all these other things. Do you get what I'm saying, bro? Dude, I, sometimes I'm like, sometimes I'm like, I don't want to be here anymore. Like yeah. everything is horrible. What I'm like, I'm so glad I never made my own children. And then I'm like, oh, I'm just hungry. I'm just hungry. I need some carbs and everything feels better. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, just having some tools like that, eh, that just give you a reality slap, um, you yeah. know, it's just really useful. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> How do we mainstream this though? You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I you know, you oh, make well, here's, sure here's, 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 here's my effort, you know, yeah, to be right. quite honest. And I think part of the problem here is that 
And this is like one of the key messages that I put in this book that I think is so crucial, but it's so, so poorly understood or poorly communicated or not known at all. And that is, you know, your emotional experiences, they are just signals your body is sending you, okay? They're just signals. And your job is to notice and interpret the signals, okay? So you can decide then what you do with them rather than just be driven by them. And when I say they're signals, I want you to think of them as comparable to thirst and hunger. That is literally all they're like. They're just like thirst and hunger. And in fact, when we break it down, if we break down your emotional experiences in the most simple way, they're just trying to send you signals to get you to do one of two things, either to stay as you are or to move, to change, to shift. Mm -hmm. So a pleasant emotional experience is trying to get you to stay. An unpleasant emotional experience is trying to get you to shift or change something. That is literally all it's doing, right? So they're like thirst and hunger. So when you experience thirst, Richie, what <laughs> signal your body's sending you? Go get a drink. Go get a drink, right? Now, sometimes you're not in a position to do that, right? Yeah. So you just, you just deal with the discomfort. You make space for it. That's okay. But you're very clear on the signal your body's trying to send you here. But the problem is, is we have all these unhelpful ideas about emotions that we lose track of the simple fact they're just signals our body's trying to send us. They're not things to judge as good or bad. Do you judge thirst or hunger as good or bad when you feel it? You go, oh my God, oh my gosh, I'm such a bad person, I'm feeling hungry. I'm not <laughs> supposed to feel hungry. Or do you walk around, Richie, going, no one else feels hungry. Why do <laughs> I feel so hungry? <laughs> do you walk around doing that? Of course you bloody don't, right? Yeah. But we inhabit this world where people get these ideas that you should never feel unpleasant emotions. You should never feel anything distressing. And as a result of that, what they do is when they start worrying, they start worrying about worrying. Mm. When they start feeling stressed, they start stressing about being stressed. Instead of going, what's the signal my body is trying to send me right now? What would be the most effective thing to do with this? What action can I take or not take on this basis? Can, can we talk about that? Because we are, I think, in this climate where everyone's talking about mental health. Everyone's yep. talking about mental illness. Everyone's talking about mental fitness. These things are like ubiquitous on mainstream media. They're even more present on social media where so many people go as a coping mechanism for their yep. unpleasant experiences. And I feel like we're swimming in an ecosystem of, of really traumatized people actually unintentionally doing more harm than good sometimes by what yep. they're putting into the into the into the into the world and so many people are, will read like someone who's got a two hundred thousand followers as thought piece around unpleasant experiences and then like oh yeah i shouldn't be like this and in fact i feel like it's making us more fragile and more prone to negative experiences and and more like can you clap in sign language by the way yeah. bro I <laughs> yeah. agree more, right? I, agree more. I was like i like it i don't know what it is it's but, clapping in sign language you know? okay. <laughs> and um actually not resilient for the inevitable suffering that life will will bring us and particularly younger people who have grown up with iphones in their back pockets and we see the rise in anxiety depression and other, you know, negative mental experiences. So, how do we how do we have the conversation about mental health matters, and at the same time create resiliency? You're gonna. Yeah, it's interesting, eh? Because you know, like, what you don't want to do is you don't want to come across as dismissive of people's struggles. Yes. Because the reality is, is you know, like, again, let's use the let's use the physical fitness analogy. Mm -hmm because that's why I use the term mental fitness to communicate that there's a lot of parallels. We're not all created equal when it comes to our physicality, right? You've trained heaps of people. You will have come across people who just are talented, bro. Naturally, genetically, they still have to do the work, but they are going to advance a lot more than other people, right? You yeah. come across that? Yeah. You know, I've, I've had the, the pleasure of standing next to Sonny Bill Williams once, and I'll tell you what, we're not all created equal, bro. Oh, my God, I felt bad. We are not all created equal. <laughs> Thanks to my wife's enduring disappointment, no matter how much time I spend at the gym, I am never looking like Sonny Bill. Hey. I feel you, bro. Yeah. But all of us have this capacity to get closer to our own personal potential, and this is kind of what it's like in terms of our resilience and mental toughness. 
is that we're not all created equal. Some people can cope with levels of stress and pressure that are insane. I've had the distinct pleasure of doing some work with the SAS as a, as a function of riding the spoke, observing them do some of their training, working with the special forces and more broad uh, defense force psychologists around the mental skills used there. And by the time you get through SAS selection, man, you've gone through a number of filtering processes that really do establish the people who are left can cope with extreme amounts of misery and suffering, bro. They can make their way through it and still be effective. And that's a key idea, right? Is even people at that level, it's not that they don't feel it, it's that they're way better at making their way through it. It's still doing what they need to do. So we're not all created equal in that respect. And some of those people could cope with levels of adversity and challenge that would have the rest of us, you know, really traumatized, really negatively impacted. So again, you don't want to be dismissive of different people being in different places in that respect. But also we need to shift away from this idea that unpleasant emotions are unnatural or, or are wrong because when we think that, it actually makes us more fragile. It deprives us of the opportunity to actually build our resilience and mental toughness through exposure to it. You know, the way you get better at coping with stress is through experiencing it, not avoiding it. But part of the problem is, is over the last number of decades is we've moved uh, in this direction of safetyism in society. Now, there's some really good things there, right? Like if you're going to be climbing a ladder or whatever, we really want to sort of discourage you in a professional environment from taking big risks physically, eh? So, you know, that's all good. But also we've moved into this emotional safetyism with kids. We deprive them of the opportunities to learn independence, to solve problems themselves, and to realize that unpleasant emotions are just par for the course. That They're not a, a threat to be avoided. They're a challenge to be embraced. They're part of the human experience. And as a result of the safetyism, you know, we've deprived people of that chance to, to get more resilient, to get more mentally tough. And it's a really challenging one, eh? Like um, my kids are uh, Cook Island Māori via their mother, and we were over there recently. And one of the things I love about being over there is that, you know, there's not the same culture of safetyism. You know, there's a lot more opportunity for independent play over there. You know, the kids can ride in the back of the... Oh, no. the you, you know, in, in the flatbed of the pickup, that sort of stuff. That's cool, man. That's a really cool thing for kids. And you want to encourage them to engage in a bit of risk taking because that's what helps them develop a as adults. But also as well, you want to move away from that historical tendency to encourage that, but then to be really emotionally dismissive. And you yeah, have all those balance. It's a right. Right. Yeah. Well, cool. That's the question, eh? Is how do we try and bring that pendulum back to the middle? Because what's happened is I grew up during a period, you grew up during a period where you were told, harden up, I'll give you something to cry about, all of that useful stuff, eh, that makes you an emotionally repressed adult <laughs> who's incapable of having meaningful intimate relationships with people. So there's that great stuff. But now we've swung in this other direction, which is this emotional um, sort of permissiveness where we're going, if you feel anything unpleasant, you are unsafe. Richie, you're unsafe when someone's coming at you with a knife. You're unsafe when you're on the road and a car's coming at you. You're unsafe standing on the top of a rooftop. You are not unsafe just because you feel uncomfortable oh my someone God. has a different opinion. I really love you saying that because I've seen this like dominate political discourse in the last five years. And they want, you know, people, you can't even hear an alternate idea or query like an, uh, like an ideological orthodoxy without being accused of being like, there's been this concept creep and definition creep of words, like ideas of violence. And there is this whole concept of right. safetyism that you've explained really, really well. Yeah, And it's been really, really confusing and difficult to adjust to for me as someone who, you know, my academic background, sociology and political science and robust debate was part of how I went through university in my in my 20s and then obviously social media extended all of that and now it's yeah it's exactly what you're talking about well, you can forget about robust debate because that's not the path now is it the path is you know complete compliance and agreement or annihilation alienation all that sort of stuff yeah, it's it's really 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 confusing to see big big institutions as well like whether it's companies or governmental departments or uh, academic institutions bow down to that conception 
of how things should be. Yeah, it's incredibly unhelpful. And this is the thing, right? It's like you might go, oh, well, you know, it's just words. And, you know, I suppose the irony there is the whole words of violence thing. And, you know, and again, like for me, words can be incredibly problematic. They can be oppressive. They can be distressing. Yes. But there's a big difference between being punched in the face or attacked with a knife or a bat or something else. I've personally experienced all those things. I know you've experienced lots of violence too. Yeah. I tell you what, violence is violence. You know, words can be really problematic, but they're not violence. It's not that's the same right. thing. I really um, appreciate you saying that because I feel like a lot of the people driving that narrative haven't even had a pillow fight, let alone a fist yeah. fight. And I, that's, not, that's not to celebrate violence. No, but like no. When you've been around physical violence and been involved in being a victim and a perpetrator of those things, it really, really highlights the difference between that and yeah. I don't agree with this idea and your, yet your idea is violence. But also here's the problem, right? Is that when we use language like that, what we do is we actually escalate the impact of the experience for ourselves. So let me give you an example, right? So let's look at a word like, oh, say being scared or being anxious. Let's look at those two words because those reflect the same sort of like ballpark emotion. Sure. But one's more intense than the other. That's the sort of difference between them, okay, is level of intensity. You know, I feel scared versus I feel anxious versus I feel worried versus I feel uneasy, maybe. Those are all related, but different levels of intensity, right? Yeah. When I've got the situation and going, oh my gosh, I feel really scared about talking to Richie and about seeing the one thing on this platform, then my internal emotional experience, you know, rises to be consistent with that level of, of emotional labeling. Whereas when I go, actually, I think I'm more just a bit anxious. When I dial down the language I use, my body has a consistent response as well of dialing down the level of cortisol and adrenaline and the rest of it. Mm. When I go, actually, I'm not even sure I'm anxious. Maybe I'm just actually a little bit, a little bit uneasy. Or maybe even, you know what? Maybe I'm actually, what I'm feeling is a little bit of excitement. Well, you know what, Richie, maybe what I'm feeling is what motivation feels like. Mm. And I'm going to make sure that I make the effort to clearly articulate myself and explain anything if I don't say the right thing. Do you get what I'm saying here, bro? No, a hundred percent. I worry that a lot of people talk themselves, as you're talking about, into, they talk their experience into their identity. Yeah. So they, they don't have they're not experiencing anxiousness, they have anxiety, do you know? Or, right, yeah, it's like, it's, like a self, it's a self, it's kind of like their trauma. Once I got, I'm trying to, I'm not articulating this very well. Once I got asked to give a talk about being the adult child of an alcoholic, right? And, and you know, you talk about like the, 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 the laundry list and all the sorts of things that you learn about at Al-Anon and you're familiar with all that, right? And um, but they wanted to know how to introduce me. And I was, and, and I said, well, don't introduce me as the adult child of an alcoholic because that's something I experienced. That's not yeah. something who I am. Does that, does that make sense? Like there's a distinction between what we go and these particular states and then who we are. And I see a lot of people put their, their trauma or their mental, uh, the, perhaps their mental illness into like their bio on their social media platform and that to me is troubling because then it becomes a stuck state and actually we know for most of us if we do the work we can move through these things and move from a place of survival to a place of flourishing and yet I worry that we're socially validating and even encouraging like a I hate to sound boomery but like a victim mentality you know. <laughs> Does that make yeah, sense, look, bro? Of course it does. And it goes back to the point I made originally where I was saying, hey, look, you know, what I experienced sexual abuse was, was really minimal, not only in terms of the comparative trauma that people experience, but because I don't conceptualize that as part of my identity and my narrative. That's exactly what I was talking about before. It's like, okay, it's part of the journey. It's the same. Like, bro, I'm a convicted murderer. You know, let's just feel the weight of that, eh? And I was saying to you when we yeah. and had a chat previously that, you know, it's, it's taken me years to even be able to say that, to get that word out of my mouth and to own that because it is so heavy, the way to me. But that's not like my self-identity. That's, that's just yeah. part of my journey, part of what I've been through. 
but I'm not, I'm not trapped by that. Whereas you can be. And also as well, it's like even the use of the word triggered is one that with someone with a psychological background, I worry about. Okay. You know, it's like an escalating bit of language. Basically, I'm someone who's definitely had um, PTSD associated symptoms, okay, from my experiences of violence in my life. You know, I've had flashbacks, I've had hypervigilance, I've had nightmares, I've had all sorts of stuff, all the textbook stuff you tick through, right? For hypervigilance, or oh, sorry, for PTSD. Now, normally in psychology, when you use the term trigger, you're talking about like creating a flashback type scenario from a previous serious trauma where something reminds you of that. But now the word has come into use for feeling distressed. Yeah, that's Anytime it. I feel uncomfortable, I've been triggered. Yeah. Whereas yeah, again, yeah. for me, this is an example of using language to escalate the negative impact that we have to experience rather than to just give ourselves a bit of a reality check and go, actually, I just feel a bit uncomfortable here. Yeah, you know? I know. It's like... Um... It's like the professional and academic jargon has come through academia and professional spaces into social media, and it's been widely adopted, but not adopted correctly. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and I mean, language evolves, right? You know, yeah. so it's kind of like, you could say there's been an evolution there, but it's, it's not been a helpful one. That's my concern. Yeah, I, I, I hear your concern, and it's really, really nice to hear yourself exp exp express all this because I walk around it in my head with my head and I talk to my partner who has no time for these earthly secular matters because she's <laughs> on a different path you know she's explored spirituality and meditation and like eastern philosophy and and I'm like obsessed with these 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 topics so it's really actually reassuring to hear I'm not alone in that although I worry how do you get um you know, there are generational differences between these conceptualizations. Yeah. And how do we potentially find younger people to stash things back to perhaps a more robust state? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is the thing too, right, is it's kind of like, remember I made that comment earlier about how we, we operate within an, an, an ecosystem, right? Yeah, yes. You know, we're not like these isolated beings. And I think the thing there is to go, well, what are the more systemic influences that can have an impact here? And I would say schools are 100% crucial in this respect, right? Because schools are the ones who are really going to be, you know, or creating an environment where it's either going to be healthier or unhealthier ideas that carry on yeah. uh, for the people who can't. That's my thought anyway. And like, I've always thought, geez, like it wouldn't be a big cost or expense to have emotional literacy on the curriculum is a really small part of, you know, like the, the development phase of whatever, wherever you do that. And, and I don't think it's a hard thing to do at all. And I just think if, if emotions were more normalized and better understood so that we don't automatically have to jump to these really extreme versions, so we don't automatically have to go, I'm unsafe. You know, I'm triggered, I'm, I'm scared, I'm this, where I can go, actually, look, I'm a little bit uneasy, I'm a bit ho ha here, you know, uh, I, I, I feel a bit argumentative, you know, if, if, if we had the nuance to be able to more correctly determine what signals were being sent via our body, it would be way easier to respond appropriately. Yes, bro. Yeah. And it's not hard, right? It's like, you know, it's, it's like, your stepson, he's going, he's going to school. He's learning words, right? He's learning how to spell words. He's learning what they mean. His vocabulary is increasing. You know, why can't we just have a piece in there which is also teaching, you know, emotions, words, and their yeah. means? We, we actually do that at home because my partner teaches meditation and she helps, nice. she helps people who have had historic alcohol problems, which yeah. she has, and obviously my father has alcohol, to notice themselves noticing themselves. And, and look at those emotional states and what are leading them to pick up again. Right? Do you know yeah. what I mean? And so we try and do that with Jack, my our stepson. Like, how, how are you feeling? Or, you know, like, what's going on? And he's getting really good at articulating himself. I'm a little bit yeah. sad. Can I just read my book by myself? Is like actually an amazing thing for a seven-year-old to be able to tell me. And I'm like, cool, I'll just go just be useless somewhere else. You know, like, I'll just be an accessory. Um, 
Yeah, and I, I fully tell Toko what you're saying. It's like, how do we help our... I mean, fuck, you ever use algebra? I never did. <laughs> like, how do, no, we, no. How, do we, how do we fit something else into the curriculum that is such an important skill? And I think... Nice. I do think skill, schools are open to those things. Actually, yeah. like, uh, like, I'm heading up to my kid's school to teach kickboxing at 12 o'clock. And they're mm-hmm. seven, you know, like schools are increasingly inviting different people in to talk about different things. So I think it's something to develop, but how would you mainstream that, I guess, is... Yeah, and, and also recognising that even with an idea like that, right, like it, it, it's an experiment mm-hmm. and you've got to treat it as such and go, oh, well, let's see what works here and how we need to adapt and, and, and adjust to be more effective and what doesn't work. And I, know I can use my eldest boy as an example. We mm-hmm. certainly do it at home as well. And sometimes he'll be upset and I'll... I go, oh, how are you feeling? And he'll go, angry, sad, annoyed, frustrated, <laughs> everything but happy. <laughs> well, it's kind of like he's using this against me, eh? Hey? He's using this vocabulary <laughs> against me. And, you know, so so I just want to acknowledge that as well, as, as I think, and this will be an interesting one, and it's not my, my expertise is not in developmental psychology. Sure. So I can't tell you at exactly the right age you want to introduce this into the curriculum. And I do think there will be an age where it's way more effective than otherwise. But for my mind, it has to be before people start going through puberty and adolescence, because at that point, you know, your prefrontal cortex, that thinking part of your brain is closed down for renovations, bro. Sure. So, you know, you need to develop the skills prior to that. And also at that period in your life, you experience more intense emotional experiences than at any other point in your life. You know, do you remember being like a teenager where everything's of like, you know, um, epic Shakespearean Greek tragedy proportions, man? Oh, dude, I think that only finished about a year ago for me. <laughs> <laughs> but it literally is more intense. Yeah, I mean, it is. Look it at is. Listeners and go, hey, look, this is like what you're feeling is actually not the same as how it feels for me. So I'm going to actually give you a bit more leeway here. And, and you know, accept that yeah, it's quite a useful thing. So again, there's a few different elements, but it doesn't seem too hard, mm-hmm. eh? It's just about getting that, yeah. I suppose, that, that support. And I agree with you. I find that the, the people I deal with, the teachers, the schools, mm-hmm. they're keen on this stuff. They're into yeah. it. So it's just a matter of trying to make that happen. And there's some great people out there doing great things. Creating oh, there are a million people sorts. doing brilliant things, you know? Hey, um, Paul, I would love to talk to you for another two or three hours. Oh, um, oh. I do have to go um, tell some seven-year-olds to run around. This has been a real, real um, insightful conversation. I'd love to talk to you more. You've got so much to share. Where can people get in touch with you? Where can they follow your work? Uh, yeah, so probably the easiest way is to just follow me on uh, social media, on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn or YouTube. And that's just at DR Paul Wood. So that should be pretty straightforward. And you've got your books, obviously, that we talked about at the outset. Yeah, bro. Good good or bad bookshops should have those. <laughs> um, Mighty Apes always a good option. You know, they tend to do things at a discount. But, you know, rocking into it calls, whatever, you know, it should be easy. And and for me, I listen to a lot of books. So there's audio book versions of those. Oh, yeah? You're on Audible and stuff? Okay, amazing. Yeah, Paul, thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Um, I really look forward to, to, to doing this again more. Yeah, cut it, bro. Yeah, awesome.